have the opportunity and privilege to introduce Sirish. Sirish, I was just thinking about it. That it was 2011 at Sunni at Saint Garden. That was the first one. The 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 opening ceremony was it, I think, and it was an amazing event. And I still remember that I had never gone to that garden, and I had the opportunity with Dr. Gerg to be present there. Uh, but here it is. It's been an interesting journey for Sini, and it's also been interesting for ISF. And I'm looking forward to this summer event again. And uh, for everybody else, I would like to introduce Sirish Rao, who is the co-founder of uh, Indian Summer Festival, uh, Summer Art Society in 2011, and has served as the artistic director since then. Sirish has been responsible for introducing some of the world's most exciting artists thinkers to Vancouver audiences in a roster that features Nobel, Booker, Grammy, and Oscar-winning artists alongside emerging talent. Sirish was born in Bangalore, spent a decade as director of Tara Books, a renowned publisher in India. Sirish is a published writer whose books have been translated into 17 languages. I was just reading that. I was like, I got to find those books. I want that book or those books. I want to read them. He's had won several international awards. Sirish has worked in cultural production in four continents with some of the world's leading cultural institutions, including Paul Getty Museum, LA, Museum of London, National Institute of Design. And for this, I actually had to Google Translate. It's like Mudu Kwai Branly Paris. Uh, it's Kwai Branly Museum and Kunsthal Rotterdam. Suresh was on the advisory committee for Cultural Shift, Vancouver's new cultural plan from 2020 to 2029. It's gonna be an exciting future and you're gonna be part of that, Suresh. And on the jury of 2021, the 10 Governors Award for Literacy, Literary Excellence. He sits on the advisory board of the Global Reporting Center and Solid State Community Industries. Suresh is deeply committed to playing his part in ensuring that Vancouver is engaged in meaningful, local, and global conversations. And I hand over to Suresh now. Thank you so much, Manish. And I think that's a nice segue, meaningful, local, and global conversations, which I think is exactly what we're about to have here now, and that I'm so proud that CINI is, is facilitating. Um, and I thought I would just give a little bit of context uh, to the conversation that I'm really excited to hear myself uh, that follows, and that is that um, at Indian Summer Festival, we've been partners with SINs right from the beginning, right from year minus one, I would like to say, because Dr. Arun Garg was one of the first people I spoke to about founding a festival of arts and culture, and he's been an invaluable advisor. I think the approach that we take to the arts is that the arts are a transformative and healing force. Um, and I think we've only had to look around us during the pandemic to know that in this time of confusion and despair and, and illness, we have turned to books and music and song. And I remember when Milan was being ravaged by the pandemic, there were people singing to each other from the balconies. It's how we affirm to each other that we create, that we are alive, that we are connected. And I also believe that the arts um, in some way can call us to participate in the world as beings that create rather than destroy. And for all these reasons, I think that arts are really crucial. Um, and where they meet healing, uh, this is an interesting exploration that we've had together, Indian Summer Art Society and CINS, to create a program called Artist as Healer, I think those of you who are at the, um, the opening um, of, of CINI um, day before yesterday would have heard a quote by Dr. Arun Garg, which was in his op-ed in the province that um, health is more than the absence of disease. And so we see health as cultural health, spiritual health, physiological health, all of these things uh, need to go together. And that's what we did with this program called Artist as Healer is to invite people to bring these two kinds of inquiry, scientific and artistic together and find remedies against despair and potions for joy. Um, but also to know that there are ways in which we look at 
the arts and healing in a much more evidence-based um, structured way. And I think that's, that's exactly what we've been doing. And I'm so thrilled that Maitri, Yogitarini Maitri, is the first artist as healer in this, in this culture lab um, and is proposing these ways forward. Um, I remember Dr. Garg years ago, we tried to bring this artist and scientific inquiry together when we invited Dr. Harold Varmus, whose um, work on um, the cancer gene won him the Nobel Prize in medicine. And his son had a jazz sextet and they played jazz while they spoke about gene structure. And they were both searching for the learning that comes from dissonance, the learning that comes from aberrations, the learning that comes from the silence between notes by the breaks in DNA structure. So I, I think we have been on this journey. I'm so excited that we're here now with the Maitri as part of this and these incredible speakers. It is my honor to introduce the person who will moderate this discussion, who is none other than Shushma Dutt, who you know, requires very little by way of any kind of introduction because she's an absolute legend. She is an icon uh, to all of us in the South Asian community here. She's a broadcaster. Uh, everybody knows Spice Radio and um, Radio Rim Jim that she runs, but not everybody knows that she started out as a reporter in the 60s for the BBC um, when she was rubbing shoulders with the likes of Mick Jagger and uh, gave Jimi Hendrix a bit of a hard time for, um, for portraying a Hindu god on one of his albums. Um, she's interviewed you know, heads of state, uh, runs two radio stations, but I think what I value most about Shishma Ji is whenever there's a path to be broken, whenever there's a new line of inquiry to be taken, whenever courage needs to be displayed in showing the way to something new, whether that's in politics, in culture, or in health, she's always there to give us a platform. So um, she's been recognized for that with a Jack Webster Award. She's been recognized with an Order of British Columbia and is always in the list of the most influential British Columbians um, you know, in our midst. So, what do you say to a legend other than thank you so much for giving us this space and over to you, Shushma Ji. Thank you so much, um, Sidish Ji. And uh, thank you, Dr. Gurg, for this thought provoking special edition of CINI in cooperation with Indian Summer Festival uh, to talk about women's health and to see it through the lens of integrative healing and care, Shakti, the artistic and healing force artist as a healer. Today's vast topic has been matched with three very powerful women who equally hold vast knowledge in their respective fields. Let me first introduce each one of them to you. Today's speakers are, as uh, uh, Sirish mentioned, Yogacharini Maitriji. Maitriji, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you, Sushmaji. <laughs> and our uh, next speaker is going to be Dr. Farah Shroff, who I think is uh, calling in from Boston. How are you doing, Dr. Saima? I'm doing very well, Shushmaji. Thank you. And we also have Hannah Marsh from Edmonton. Hannah Ji, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. Great. So I will now introduce each speaker and ask them to talk for no more than seven minutes on their topic. And if you want to talk more, hey, who am I to stop? So we'll start with Yogacharini <laughs> Maitriji, who is an, uh, an international master teacher and founder of Arkea Awareness Center and Arkea Foundation. Her grandfather was her first guru who taught her the mysteries of yoga. And for the past 25 years, she has been dedicated to living and sharing holistic life principles. Since 1997, she has been given many prestigious titles like yoga expert, yoga shuramani, yoga acharini. She, has, uh, she was one of the youngest people to be invited to be on the advisory board of World Yoga Council in 2007 in Europe. Yoga acharini uh, enjoys nature and Ayurvedic food, lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. I give you yoga acharini Maitriji. Thank you so much, Shishma Ji. Uh, what a delight to be here. I'm going to invite everyone uh, to start off with a very simple practice. And in the traditional tantric school I come from, the first starting point is ourselves. So what we're going to do is uh, engage in a very simple practice to create this beautiful harmony within. 
this harmony of right and left of the masculine and feminine. And a simple practice to do that is to bring the right and left palm and fingers together and just take a moment here. So just the tips of the fingers are touching and keep the eyes closed. And check to see how you're holding your body. If you can find that dance of Shiva and Shakti, dance of the polarities, which means the dance of having a firm body, yet a relaxed stance. Now let's be aware of the breath. That's the beauty of yoga. It helps us become aware of every aspect of our being, the body, the breath, our energy. How is your energy feeling this morning? Can you sense chi or energy between the palms and the fingers? Where is your mind at? So it's a multifold awareness that we practice. Awareness of the body, awareness of the breath, awareness of energy, awareness of the mind, awareness of the emotions, and awareness of our connection to the cosmos. Once we are aware, we can see what serves us and what doesn't serve us and therefore shift things for the better, be it lifestyle changes, be it having healthy boundaries, be it shifting communication in a relationship. And all this contributes to our health and our well-being. And let's take one deep breath to that, breathing in, expanding our diaphragm, lower, mid, upper chest, and breathing out through the mouth with the lips pouted. We'll do this one more time. Breathe in. Expanding, expanding. And breathing out. One last time. Nice, deep, deep, deep breath. And releasing. <sighs> Gently rubbing the palms together. And bringing them on the eyes. As we soothe the eyes, the zoom, zoomed out eyes, and turn them inwards, cultivating inner sight or insight. And gently relaxing the palms. And I'd like to do a little screen share. I'm going to run through a few points. Is the screen being shared? Or maybe I can ask Jesse to help me with that. I had emailed her the link. There, thank you, Jesse. So the first bit, as you can see, is this beautiful representation. And the I like to call the ancient yogis or rishis, uh, the ancient researchers. So they researched the human body, human emotions, human mind. And they said in traditional tantra, the dance of Shiva and Shakti is what represents a harmonious manifestation of so-called opposites within. And that is true integration. So if we have Shiva, Shiva is consciousness and Shakti is the creative and healing force. Now within us, if we have a lot of Shiva energy, which means we are very conscious, but we don't have any Shakti or power, then what happens is we have all these great ideas that don't manifest in the world or we have a lot of power and no consciousness, then we can go around terrorizing people, maybe in our small pockets, terrorize the world, there's money power, there's uh, knowledge power, but no consciousness in terms of how to execute it in the world. So I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Jesse to just scroll down. 
So the three main manifestations of Shakti are a beautiful model to look at how we can heal ourselves and also create beautiful things in our lives where we become the experiment and the experimenter, where we become the dancer and the danced. So Durga means a fortress, and I'm gonna ask Jesse to scroll down further. And you can see this beautiful symbolism of Durga. Her name itself means a fortress. And she's the sort of woman you don't wanna mess with because she's holding, she's got like four arms on either side. I mean, and all these weapons, she's got this lion as a vehicle, like who would wanna mess with her? And the breath that is connected to her is the diaphragmatic breathing. So let, I'm gonna invite you to place your palms on the diaphragm a little above the navel. You don't have to look at me, just a little above the navel, connect to this region. Now, this is your Durga energy. And how do we tap into her energy? By various yogic practices and also by becoming aware of our lives. So that's the beauty of the yogic practice. So let's say we create the sound ha, taking a nice deep breath and making a sound ha. So that is the Durga energy we are tapping into. And by doing that, we become a fortress for ourselves and for that which is right. Now, when we understand the associations, I had a student who basically had a lot of depletion in the solar plexus area. That's because of her sexual abuse as a child. And because of that, she developed an autoimmune disease. And through the healing process, she was able to manage this aspect. Another student, Again, for her, this Durga energy was depleted because she was in Sri Lanka, war. So um, she lost her home. Long story short, you know, after a lot of trauma work and healing work, she was able to conceive after seven years of not conceiving. And that's beautiful to see. But for somebody who studies Tantra, you know the associations. Yes, this area depleted, this area connected to your sexual organs, reproductive organs. So it's not going to uh, be harmonious or it's not going to function properly. So I'll ask Jesse to go down further. Now I'm going to ask you to connect to your mid chest region and look at this beautiful symbolism, this woman having gold coins pouring out of her hands. So it's, it's beautiful to have all these visuals because we don't have to remember Lakshmi mid chest. And as we breathe deeply into the mid chest, what happens is that we're able to cultivate self-love. I mean, many times in the new age circles, we have this thrown around. Yeah, you, you need self-love before we need to love others. But how do we do this? Again, there are beautiful tools to cultivate self-love, especially the mid chest breathing. And when we do that, I think it was uh, Dr. Bhava who was saying, yeah, it's the mindset that needs to come. You know, first where we can do good things for ourselves where we can have a healthy lifestyle for ourselves. And that mindset shift of feeling that self-worth comes from accessing this Lakshmi energy. Now I'll ask Jesse to scroll down again. Thank you, Jesse. And the last Shakti that I want to again introduce you to is Saraswati. And if you see her name itself, it's the one who possesses flow, the one who possesses beautiful speech. And if you see at the bottom, she has a hamsa. Now, a hamsa is the embodiment or a swan. It's the embodiment of discernment. So she's able to discern. She's able to tap into the higher arts and represent or manifest in her life. And all women and men, because they also have the Shakti in them, can in their own homes manifest beauty and subtlety and joy and love and protection. All these Shaktis are inherent within us. So she's a beautiful representation. Again, I don't have to describe her, just keeping in uh, mind the time. And then we can leave at that. So the last bit I wanted to share, and then later on I'll share other things, is the artistry of Mother Nature. I was just going out for a walk. And, uh, you know, this is just what I took on my phone, <laughs> a few photographs I wanted to share. And I was just amazed with the colors, you know, not the sound, sight, smells, the artistry that we create, but just look at the artistry of mother nature. So I'm just gonna ask Jesse to scroll down this and pay tribute to her, the First Nations people of the land. And all of you, each one of you who have created beauty in your lives in the small and the larger things. And these are unretouched. Uh, they haven't been cropped. I just put them 
on from my phone really quickly to say, wow, look at the magnificence we live in. This is the power of Shakti. This is the healing power of Mother Nature. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. So on that note, I'll close and I'll take a bit more time later. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so very much. You know, when you're talking about those plants and flowers, um, we I saw a plant with leaves that have got holes in them and they come out like that. I mean, it, it seems like somebody sat there and, you know, beautifully cuts little holes in the leaves and looks beautiful. But that's nature, isn't it? Thank you, Yuka Charani. Our next speaker is Dr. Farah Shroff. She is an incoming Harvard School of Public Health Takemi Fellow in Global Health. She works in the Department of Family Practice and the School of Pop uh, Population and Public Health in the University of British Columbia's Faculty of Medicine. A mouthful right there. An emphasis on her research is envisioning and developing health for all. Her main areas of research are integrative health, approaches, and social environmental justice for a, from a very feminist anti-racism lens. I give you women's health researcher and educator, Dr. Farah Shroff. Thank you so much, Shishma Ji. Thank you so much, Arun Ji, um, uh, Maitri Ji, all of you, Suresh Ji, all of you, thank you so much for all the work that you have done to make this beautiful gathering happen. It's a delight for me to be here. This morning, I went to a place near Boston called the Butterfly Place, and I surrounded myself in this botanical garden with the beautiful Shakti of butterflies floating everywhere. I've never in my life been surrounded with so much um, of that beautiful energy of transformation that the butterfly brings. So I bring to you that beauty and, and uh, wonder and amazement of the butterfly on this Father's Day. And I just want to take a moment to say that we're here to, to celebrate and to support women and women's health and the rising of Shakti in the world, which we need so much. And we really, we really do need our fathers and our brothers and our uncles to be there as we do this. I want to acknowledge that a few years ago, for Father's Day, I was interviewed by the province newspaper in the lower mainland of British Columbia for a Father's Day edition about yoga. And the reporter wanted to know why it was that it was mainly women who did yoga. And so we spent a very, very long time doing this. And then one of my research assistants at the time, a resident who then became a family physician, Dr. Raja Krandawa, was on the front page of the province newspaper on Father's Day a few years ago, doing a beautiful Padmasana. And I would like to dedicate the rest of this talk to Dr. Raja Krandawa because he sadly passed away in a car accident a few years later. So to the fathers and to the men who are working through their toxic masculinity and all the challenges that men bring as they, as they work to support women and to support the rise of Shakti and the, and the rise of better health for all of us. So now to just talk a little bit about women's health and integrative thinking. In the way that I think about improving women's health, there are two avenues. One is a pretty classic public health uh, approach, and that is that we need to distribute two things better. One is um, basically power. We need to distribute, make the world more equitable. We need to rid ourselves of the kinds of fear-driven ways of thinking, which are really the opposite of integrative thinking, um, that drive patriarchy and that drive um, misogyny and that drive heterosexism, all of those kinds of all of those kinds of forces of power. So that's the one area that I work in. Then the other area is to bring a greater integration of mind, body, spirit. And so I believe that both of those things, the structural on the one hand and the, the spiritual, the individual on the other hand, are 
if broke, brought together, if integrated together, are going to make the biggest differences. So because we're here talking about uh, potions for joy and artistry, I'd like to talk about one way um, in, in our work at Maternal and Infant Health Canada that we are just planning on doing that because we're here talking about the artist as healer. So I founded and lead an organization called Maternal and Infant Health Canada that works to improve the health of women and the environment, primarily in India and Canada, through education, research, and innovation. And our innovation is the support of international indigenous systems of health promotion and disease prevention, such as Ayurveda, yoga, and meditation. And we're just starting a new project with colleagues here at Harvard called Lullaby Agent. And it is going to be bringing the beauty of song and music to improving uh, a women's children's and uh, a women's and children's health primarily. Um, so we're using music. Um, the, the power of music is something that is just burgeoning in the literature to be explored as a way of truly improving mental and physical health. In Ayurveda, it's been used for quite a long time, but the idea of this lullaby agent project is to support two things, mental, um, physical, and spiritual well-being, as well as language revitalization. So we're starting in, um, in a BIPOC community, in a Black Indigenous People of Color community, the Quechua speaking community um, here in the US to bring ancestral music to families here um, and thereby bringing back the language, bringing back this idea that we can love ourselves for, for, for being immigrants despite the challenges that racism and other forms of oppression bring us and feel the joy. I really love what Sirish said about potions for joy because music is so much a potion for joy. So we invite any of you who are interested in learning more about Lullaby Agents to be, uh, to be in touch with us um, and, and to be in touch with me. I wanna talk a little bit now just about how um, this particular time in which we live, this, this time of COVID has been such a shifting time. I talked about butterflies and the, the way that I spent my morning. This is a true time of transformation. In many languages, the word for opportunity and crisis is just, a, is, it, it's just the opposite side of the same word. And that's the moment we live in. I really believe that those of us who have taken birth in this particular moment in world history are here for a very important reason. And that reason is because we have huge, huge shifts that are happening right now. And I believe this is our transformative moment. I believe that this time that has been really chaotic and filled with suffering is also our time to see the Shakti rise, is also our time to build a better world. We have never known that we could make such things happen. We have never known that we could stop all airplane flight. We have never known that in some places where we never saw the sky, that the sky might reappear again. We have literally seen the light. <laughs> and we, we now know that we can make things better. And for women, this is exactly what we need. This is the time we need to see women rise and to see Shakti rise. And we need to do this all together. And so I really want to just leave us a little bit before my seven minutes are done, just with this thought that we can and we must all together, men, women, transgendered, non-binary, and those who are um, non-gender non um, conforming, wherever we sit on the gender spectrum, we can join hands across the world to create this better world, because that is how we lift up women's health. That is how we lift up women. We need to create better social and economic conditions so that women have the opportunity to live better in mind, body, and spirit. So I'll leave it there, Shashmaji, and thank you to all of you. Awesome, as always. Thank you so very much, Dr. Shiroff. Our next speaker is uh, Hannah Marshji a mindfulness teacher and writer. Since 2016, she has been a consultant with the mindfulnessinstitute.ca, where she facilitates mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBRS program, and runs mindfulness and creativity. 
there are these are a series of classes to foster creativity and well-being through mindfulness. A trained MBSR facilitator. Um, her training includes MBSR in mind body medicine with the Oasis Institute. She has completed mentorship training with Center for Mindfulness Studies. Hannah lives in Edmonton and currently is working on a memoir, I'm gonna read that, about mothers and daughters and healing intergenerational trauma. Hannah Washji. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here with all of you. Such remarkable, <laughs> such remarkable company here and such kind and passionate people. Thank you so much for having me. So when I was growing up, my mom practiced yoga every morning on the living room carpet. The way she talked about yoga was the way other people talked about their morning coffee. She couldn't imagine starting her day without it. And she also told me the story of my birth, how she'd meditated through labor and it had spared her a great deal of pain. And I was intrigued. As a child, I, I copied her yoga postures. And as a teenager, I started a daily yoga practice and I began to explore meditation. And in my 20s, my mother-in-law suggested mindfulness-based stress reduction. And she was an MBSR teacher. And she encouraged me to get teacher training too. And at that time, I wasn't so keen on the idea. I was preparing to go into the creative field to go to graduate school to study writing. And my ambitions were creative, not, not with mindfulness. But after my MFA in 2015, my curiosity got the best of me. And I thought I'd try one MBSR training just to see. And now I've taken several trainings, of course, and I've been facilitating MBSR for six years. And so I'll just share, just so you can get a, some context here with MBSR, share my screen. And MBSR is an eight week program. We meet weekly and have daily home practice, mindfulness practices that participants bring into their daily lives. And um, it was originally developed in 1979 at the University of Massachusetts Memorial Medical Center by John Kabat-Zinn and associates there. And Kabat-Zinn was a scientist and a student of Zen Buddhism and Vipassana and yoga. And the story goes that he had the idea for this program during a Vipassana retreat. And he wanted to bring insight meditation and yoga to people who needed more support than the medical system was offering them. And he envisioned a secular program. And although the language is secular, these practices and principles are grounded in these older traditions. And so, as MBSR teachers, what we offer has been handed down by a long line of generous teachers, many from India and South Asia. So MBSR has been studied quite a lot and I won't get too much into that as you can read more about MBSR, but I'll just mention some of this research as this integration of art and science, um, that there's been a lot of research with, with anxiety and stress. The very first research was with chronic pain, which has continued in fibromyalgia, IBS, migraine, and overall quality of life, mental health. What we often see is this increased emotional regulation, improvement in well-being, and a shift in a relationship to pain and challenge. Before I talk more, uh, I'd like to share a short practice with you. So this mindfulness teaching is first and foremost experiential. As the Buddha said, come and see for yourself. So I invite you to settle into a comfortable posture and inviting the body to settle onto the surface beneath the chair, the floor, receiving support from the earth itself. You might close the eyes if you'd like or leave them open with a soft focus. And sensing into the body the support, perhaps inviting a sense of ease to the upper body as it reaches gently to the sky, as the body settles towards the earth. And then directing attention down to the feet, 
both feet wherever they're resting. Noticing sensation along the soles of the feet, perhaps at the points of contact, gradations of pressure, sense of temperature. Exploring the soles of the feet from the heels, to the arches of both feet, each toe. Inviting a kind curiosity to the sides and tops of the feet. Receiving any sensation that might be here in the feet. These might be sensations at the surface of the skin. Sensations of clothing or air. Or sensations from deep within the feet. Perhaps of pulsing, space, substance. There might be quite a lot of sensation or very little or none at all. And that's fine, simply opening to what might make itself known moment by moment in the feet. And when attention moves elsewhere, if you noticed attention has been caught by a thought, a sound, a sensation elsewhere in the body, you can simply notice, and this is what's here. And then with kindness and patience, gently guiding attention back to settle on the feet. And then releasing this very short practice, opening the eyes if they've been closed, perhaps having a little look around the room at sensations of sight, color, sound, shape, shadow. And then coming back to our, our virtual space here that we're sharing together. And so I invite you to take a moment to reflect on what this short practice was like for you. What did you notice? And so I'll give some possibilities here. There might've been some particularity of sensation of that pressure, temperature, or a lack of sensation, noticing a lack of sensation. You might have noticed the state of the mind. You might have been busy in thought, or tired, or quiet, frustrated, bored, energized. You might have noticed signals from elsewhere in the body, hunger, thirst, itchiness, restlessness, relaxation. And you might have noticed the changes in these states, how quickly they change, how attention can move, so quickly and be brought back so quickly. How uh, we might go from relaxed to impatient to sleepy, all within a couple of breaths. So this is an insight practice, getting in touch with our own inner state, our own health and well-being, bringing the mind to the body and fostering this integration of the whole self, building capacity to be with whatever is here. Perhaps it's pleasant or neutral or unpleasant, and as many of you know, so much of suffering comes from our resistance in denying, pushing against, wishing if only things were different than they already are. So in this practice, we see if we can be with things as they are in this moment. That doesn't mean that we can't also encourage change in the future. So my, my own experience back at my first MBSR training with days of extended practice in a silent retreat, I was transformed. I'd always been quite attached to my thoughts, but now I saw how my desire to put things into words, to analyze and judge how that could obscure my view of the world and myself, and how letting go of these thoughts, I could come home to my body and I could live with a kind of openness and int intimacy with those beautiful flowers, for instance, that we saw earlier to really see them. Um, and I hadn't known that this intimacy was possible. So after years of a largely solitary practice, I, I realized joy and support of community of practicing together and a seed of an idea blossomed that I wanted to teach mindfulness alongside writing and that these practices could support each other and support myself and others that with mindfulness, we learn to be with our experience with non-judgment, openness, kindness, curiosity, and that this is a fruitful ground. 
um, that this ground encourages the conditions for well being and for creativity. And so I developed in, in 2018 the Mindfulness and Creativity Program. And creativity isn't just for the arts, as we've been speaking to, it's this natural capacity that we can access in all areas of life. And what I've seen in my classes and myself is an increased awareness about our patterns of thought and behavior and a sense of agency that we can choose new paths. And this is creativity, stepping out of comfort and familiarity of habit and choosing to do something new and different. Um, but what I've also seen in my classes myself is that this isn't easy. It takes time and practice and it takes patience, self-compassion, and it's hard to do it alone. And this is where that community comes in that we've been speaking to that Farah mentioned of us coming together, having others alongside, holding space for each other's experience, whatever it might be. Um, in my classes, I always hear that this is just one of the most valuable experiences, this mutual support and allowing each person to be exactly where they are, which can be tremendously empowering. And so when we speak about integrative health and a way forward, I see this as, as bringing together this, the body with the mind, science and art, East and West and this individual and community. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Hannah. Um, we're gonna open um, for question and answer. And I will start with uh, my very first question to all three of you. Yoga has been uh, a, uh, uh, one topic that uh, Maitriji talked about, Para talked about, and Hana, you talked about. How come I can't see myself? I just don't know. Okay, anyway, let's go on. So I was thinking when a child is born, the very first thing that a child has to take is the breath. That's the breath that gives us life. And when we go out of this plane, it's the last breath we take. And once the breath is gone, we are gone. So the importance of breath in yoga is very important, right? So the question to all three of you in different fields, Yoga Charini, Maitriji, Yoga and the breathing, Dr. Shroff, Doctor of Medicine and you know um, Health, the breathing, how important it is. And Hannah, you just took us through um, a beautiful, seven minutes of, you know, looking deep into our own souls to see what we are feeling. And breathing is very important. So all three of you, one at a time, whosoever feels like going first, talk about the breath. Well, I'm happy to go first, if that's, if that's okay. Um, I'm also a yoga teacher. I've had the honor of teaching yoga in about 50 different countries around the world. And what I have found um, teaching yoga to people who've never had it, fourth generation Palestinian refugees living in Syria and different places like that, is that it is breath. It is the breath which brings people home. I spend a lot of time with my students teaching them that baby's breath, that breath that you talked about, Shushmaji, learning just the very basic expanding when we inhale contracting when we exhale. Of the thousands of people I've taught how to breathe, I've seen that most people do it the exact opposite way. So that breath is one of the most important things to learn. And I, I, I ask my students, can you please do it every time you walk through a door? Just remember to do it all the time. <laughs> It's not just when you're sitting in my yoga class because you need it just as much or maybe even more as you're going through the rest of your life. So all those beautiful practices that um, Yoga Charini, uh, Maitri and Hana just led us through, they really did focus with the basics of the breath, just learning how to breathe and feeling how when we do breathe in that deep, slow way, we connect to our own selves and we connect to the greater life around us. It's so, it's such a deep essence of yoga, just feeling that unity and oneness. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Farah. I'm gonna, I'll take off from where Farah left. <laughs> and I've seen the same thing. I've taught so many groups and especially CEOs, they're so stressed that their breath is reversed. 
And when I teach them about the relationship between emotions, stress again is the emotion of fear and how emotions are connected to breath, then something clicks in them and says, oh, okay, this is an unconscious pattern that's been impacting my breath. And therefore, when I consciously work on my breath, I have the capacity to actually stabilize my emotions. So if they have anger or disappointment, or if they're like really reactive, then one way of dealing or managing their emotions is by actually becoming conscious and managing their breath. So that relationship is very, very useful uh, to have for everybody, not just people who are leaders or you know CEOs. So that's one piece to the breath. And also in the breath, when we actually lengthen and deepen the breath, we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest nervous system. The sympathetic is your fight flight. I won't go into too much of a lecture, but it's that fight flight freeze response when your uh, uh, system sees that there is a survival, uh, you know, or your survival is being threatened, then you go into that fight flight mode. And when you're in fight flight mode, healing is not possible. It's only in the rest and digest mode that healing is possible. Now that's the second element to breath. Then the rishis or these ancient researchers, they go even deeper. They say, okay, this is the mechanics of breathing and how it impacts the nervous system. Now, if you look at pranayama, it's not just breath, it's ayama of prana, which is the expansion of prana or life force. So breathing is one aspect of impacting or increasing your life force. And you're like, how do we impact our life force and why do we impact our life force the more life force there is in the body or the nadis are clear then there's clarity of thinking that's creativity all the gifts that i was talking about these shaktis which means we can stand up for what is right we can stand our ground we can have self-love we can love the world you know <laughs> all of that all those gifts we can partake of when there's healthy prana sh shakti and then, of course, the last piece is connecting to the cosmos and we have enough prana, we can actually download information like the internet, not just information, it's called the Vigyana Mayakosha, we download wisdom. And for a lot of people before the internet, it would have been difficult to comprehend. You know, 30 years ago, if I said, oh, you know, just by breathing and aligning, you can download wisdom. People are, would have told me I'm crazy, but now that's what's happening with the internet. You're actually downloading information. I mean, not wisdom, but information. And these Rishi said that if we're, if we have a good connection created by good electricity or prana, then we can download wisdom the wisdom of the cosmos, the collective wisdom. So on that note, I'll uh, close with the breath or the importance of the breath. There's so much more I can talk about. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Beautifully said, Anna. So yeah, this is a rich subject. I'd add a couple of things. The breath is, is always accessible. So if I mentioned to check in with the breath for the day, not just when you're sitting on the, on the mat in practice, and that um, it, the breath and the whole body at any time through the day, um, we can check in and, uh, and that can locate us to what's here now, what's here now in our inner state, maybe that shallow breathing, maybe there's some, some stress here now, maybe some anxiety or some deep calm breathing, ah, there's, there's ease here now and recognizing and appreciating that. So the breath can, can connect us to so much of our inner state. Um, and sometimes what can show up with the breath is overwhelm and trauma. So the breath is not always a safe place for everyone. Um, and so it, I think it's good to know that there are options that when there's guidance to focus on the breath and if it brings a sense of overwhelm and difficulty, you might notice that and choose instead to observe sensations at, at the feet and work with something safer in the body. Um, so I thought I'd just, just add that extra part about the breath. Beautiful. And one of our uh, uh, people who are watching this program said, the sound of breath the is breath. the voice of the Supreme. When the breath is imperfect, um, it reminds us that we are not perfect. With breath awareness, we get closer to the Supreme. I know we don't have much time, but the topic was healer, artist as the healer. And I was thinking about women's health. And um, Farah talked about... Uh, COVID, uh, what COVID has taught us. But COVID has also made life quite 
difficult for many people. I'm not just going to talk about women, but everyone. But women, women's mental health is at stake as well. So all three of you, if you can, in a few words, talk about women's mental health during COVID. That'd be very useful. I can start just start by saying that the pandemic um, all over the world, starting in Wuhan, China, uh, doubled and tripled violence against women. I published a paper on this a couple of years ago. Um, we are all at home now. So having everybody at home at a time when addictions are increasing, both alcohol addictions as well as drug addictions, um, even marijuana sales have gone up a huge amount, um, is a lethal cocktail for many women. So um, they are trapped in their homes. They do not have access to shelters because during the pandemic, a lot of the shelters were also overwhelmed. And so violence against women, sexualized violence against women, um, as, as well as uh, non-sexualized violence against women, are major contributors to women's mental health and well-being. And um, Yoga Charini Mayatri talked about one of her students who experienced sexual abuse and how yoga was able to heal her through that. So we do know that mental health, um, even apart from violence against women, has also doubled and tripled both uh, the top two mental health concerns, which are anxiety and depression, have measurably worsened in almost every part of the world uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, the economic stressors that most, uh, most, most people who especially have lost work or whose work has been changed, mm -hmm. anybody who works in the front lines and who's lost work, women are heavily, heavily uh, located in what we often call the pink ghetto in the retail sector, the hospitality sector. And those sectors were hit very hard by the pandemic. So a lot of women have lost work. The tragedy of all of this is that it's increasing hunger in many parts of the world. All of these physical, economic, and um, other challenges have a profound impact on women's mental health. So we do see that mental health has suffered um, in terms of most of the research. Now, at the same time, a lot of positive things have happened. And, and so uh, practices such as yoga and other activities, people have become much more active outdoors. Exercise is very good for, when, uh, for mental well-being, as are yoga, as are learning about Ayurveda and meditation. So we see, we see um, these, uh, these balancing factors, <laughs> uh, thankfully. Um, but but uh, um, what we do know is that the United Nations has very clearly told us that women's health and human rights have been rolled back decades, decades of work that we have done to bring women up have come down. And so we need very much to rebalance the world right now towards a time when Shiva uh, and Shakti will be more balanced and when the Shakti will rise and when women and girl children's education will be, will be valorized. Thank you, thank you so much. Anna or uh, Maitriji? Thank you so much, uh, Farah. I second that I have been seeing that those what those statistics are speaking about and also I know a lot of single women so there is that other piece of isolation as well where you know they don't have community and so of course we have online classes where they get some semblance of community and support through those online classes so that's a good thing and I also run a foundation for children uh, in India so I was speaking to this young girl uh, called Lavanya, who's, who's just a beautiful, beautiful soul. But she comes from an area which is really uh, troubled in terms of the violence there. So her husband was um, murdered, but the sad part is the people who were hired to murder him, he was not the intended target. They were so high, these kids or youngsters were so high on drugs that they actually got the wrong guy. But, and she's never worked in her life. She's a really young girl. And, you know, for her, the pandemic actually turned out to be the opposite. It turned out to be really empowering because she had that sense of community. She had Facebook. Mm 
And through Facebook, she contacted me on Messenger and sometimes technology, uh, the yogic practices, she studied yoga for, with me, you know, uh, having her mother and sister support her. So I think the sense of community that came about, of course, long story short, now she's employed in one of the top uh, hotels in uh, India where, you know, she's uh, she's taking care of front desk and everything. But what I came to say is how the not just the yogic practices, but the yogic ethos of this Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which is having this whole world as our family and saying, okay, it's not just I, me, myself, but how can I support everyone around? And if women band together, not just women, women, men, you know, we need all the genders to band together and support each other. I think that's, yeah, that's the piece I wanted to share about Thank the you. pandemic, women's health. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anna? I can speak to what I've seen in my classes. Most, most of the people in my classes are women. Um, as Fer mentioned earlier with, why is it always women in yoga classes? It's, it's a lot of women in meditation and mindfulness classes as well. And so I've seen quite a lot of, a lot of stress and burnout. And I offer some MBSR programs to professionals, a lot of them are healthcare professionals and they're burned out from working in healthcare um, during the pandemic, and then they come home and have uh, these childcare roles and, and caregiving roles, and just there's they're spread really thin. Um, and, and so, and at the same time, there can be these attitudes where other people come first, where we're always helping other people, and it can be quite difficult. And it seems particular to, to women. I'm, I assume that there, that men feel this as well. It, it seems like this difficulty in offering oneself support to get through hard times, even though there's a recognition that that support is needed in order to, to get through, in order to do these things that are meaningful to us, in order to support other people, we need to support ourselves. And, um, and so this mindfulness practice and this mindfulness practice in gather, together as a community has been quite a large support for the people who have been in, in my classes to help them help them through. And even online, it's amazing how even online, <laughs> there can be this sense of community and kindness and, and togetherness in spirit, seeing that we're not alone. Thank you so much. Uh, continuing on the topic of breath, uh, do consider attending uh, the event Song of the Breath by Yuga Charani Maitri on July 14th for um, um, festival, Indian Summer Festival, ISF. Um, we, we, I think, have about two minutes. Parting thoughts from all of you. Is there anything that uh, you haven't been able to say? Um, this is your chance. 30 seconds. Each person, <laughs> go ahead or take a minute. Okay, I'll give you a minute. Each person, a minute to say whatever you would like to say at the end of the program. Thank you, Sushma Ji. I was just speaking to that comment uh, by Mr. Persad about the song of the breath or about the uh, breath being the sound of the supreme. And yes, I just wanted to second that. And there's a beautiful name, Soham. And uh, the question to Koham, who am I, is Soham. I am the infinite. And that is the song of the breath. I am the origin. I am the infinite. Sa Aham. So I'll leave you with that thought. And because it was there in the question. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I really enjoyed being here. What a delight. Yeah. You only took 20 seconds. Thank you so very much. <laughs> uh, Dr. Shroff. Uh, I believe that one of the beauties of this moment that we're in, for those of us who work in women's health, is that we're really embracing the full gender spectrum. And we're really, really trying to embrace those who identify as women and maybe transgendered or non-binary or non-conforming uh, non to gender, gender stereotypes in any way. And I believe the real promise of doing this work that is really fully inclusive and loving to everybody who identifies as a woman is that all of us can embrace the Shiva and Shakti within all of us. Oh, wow. So those of us who identify as men and feel that they've got a tender part of themselves, when we really do understand that gender is a spectrum and that each one of us has little bits of Shiva and Shakti in us, that those men will be able to shed 
the, the straight jacket of toxic masculinity and truly express themselves for who they are, which is a nuanced, beautiful human being with some Shiva and sh some Shakti. And likewise, for those who identify typically more feminine, but sometimes feel like they want to be really strong and powerful as well, that, 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 that we are creating societies where all of us in the, the full expression of who we are as gendered beings will be loved, accepted, and free. And in the, the, the school of meditation that I belong to, um, we, we end our meditations by saying, metta bhavna to all beings, may they be happy, peaceful, and liberated. And that's really what this work is about. Beautiful, beautiful. And don't we all have the Shakti and Shiva within us, all of us? Indeed. And, yeah. Hannah? Thank you. So I'll share a quote by Peter Levitt, who says, in order to find out how to say what must be said, you have to go to the place where there are no words. And you can only do that by going through yourself and intimately contacting the world. And then often language will come forward from that. And I would like to extend this not only to language, but any, any action, creative action, and in this case, creative paths forward for health, trusting that if we contact the, ourselves in the world intimately, we will find a path forward. I take this opportunity and thank all three of you um, for participating in this glorious morning's program. As uh, Vicky O'Brien said, what a glorious morning we've had today. Um, thank you. And I feel indebted to uh, Dr. Garg and Sirish for inviting me to meet you amazing people. Thank you. Sirish, over to you. Oh, just thank you all so much. This has been an incredible. Um, I, I have nothing to say except deep gratitude um, and to all of you and to everyone who attended. And I think Dr. Garg,